All right, so starting recording now. Nice. Um, I'd just gone through all of the initial stuff. So basically uh, the parameters of the model that we're using, which is a model of hemoglobin that I've made uh, that's been deliberately uh, you know, butchered in certain ways to give you a challenge for model building and a map which I made from a, um, uh, uh, an empire data set of hemoglobin, a really nice empire data set of hemoglobin, uh, where I've just taken 50 micrographs um, uh, and you know, generated a 3.7 angstrom map. So it's deliberately poor so that you've got something to work with and that, so that later you can compare to a reference model and see how well you can actually do at that kind of real resolution. It's a real 3.7, not something that's been cut back from, uh, from a higher resolution map. Okay. Um, yep, so Kut trimmings, install that. Uh, I would also recommend installing, uh, this is one of Kut, one of uh, Paul Emsley's scripts, uh, which gives you an extra menu for refinement, uh, which is not specific to CryoEM, but certainly very useful for it. Um, so I'd recommend installing that same kind of way. Likewise for Chimera, I just have a custom strip script for Chimera that has some things that are, that I think are useful, which I'll show you in a little bit. And basically the way you install that is when you are in Chimera, which I'll just open up, uh, if you go to the preferences and then you, let me see if I can find preferences, where are you? Um, wait a second, I'm getting, uh, I'm just trying to find a window because I'm dealing with two windows here. Here we go. Um, so if you go to preferences and then go to command line, you can add this script. So chimera aliases.com. You can add any startup script you want here. This is the one that just has the things that I that I like. Uh, so you can add the location of that script, and then when you load chimera, it'll have a whole lot of extra aliases and functions and so on. And that script is included in the table that you can download from the PDF. Okay. So all right, now we'll start doing the actual things. So I'm going to open up uh, the initial model that you have. Um, uh, whoops. Let me see. This is the first time I've done this via, um, uh, via Zoom. Um, so it's going to be a little bit experimental, but let's see how we go. Um, Okay, let me open up this guy. And I'm also going to open up the map, which is an MRC. Okay, where is my map? Apparently, I didn't open that. Second. I'm wondering why I can't see that. Ah, there we go. All right. So you can see model and map. You can let me adjust that so it's more normal. Yep. You can see model and map. You can see that the two things. One, the uh, threshold is off. So we want to change that, um, which if I can just load up the volume viewer. Uh, let's change that to like 0 0.12 is about right for this map. Um, and, uh, and we'll leave it at that for now. Um, so a uh, couple of things that I like. I like using this command CFR on, um, which just gives you a little cross in the center of the screen that's locked to the center of rotation that allows for more precise navigation uh, within a map. So you can see I can go to one particular point on this helix and rotate around and that remains locked to the center of rotation, whereas normally it would process around the place. But the thing that I want to point out here is you'll notice that um, the helices here are all wrong. Uh, what I mean by that is they're left-handed. So you should be able to see here that um, this helix, for example, is a left-handed corkscrew and should be right-handed. And that's because I generated this map uh, refining from a model from a, uh, a map that was generated ab initio. 
So it wasn't generated from a PDB, which means it's got equal chance to convert to converge onto the correct or the inverted hand. And in this case, it converged on the inverted hand. So uh, to fix that, we're going to use this command, which I have over here in the tutorial. Um, and we're going to do VOP Z flip. In this case, we'll do VOP Z flip one because that's the ID of the map. And that will invert that map so that now, and I'll close the old one, so that now we have a model, a uh, map, sorry, um, which has correctly handed helices. And this is a very nice one. So you can see this is a nice, nice 3.7 um, angstrom map. You can see very clear definition of the backbone uh, and of quite a lot of side chains. And now this helix is right handed, which is what we want. Okay, so next step is we're going to reorient this uh, within the map. I'm going to change a couple of display things first. I prefer to have a mesh map um, just because I'm used to dealing with Coot. So I wrote a little alias to do that, um, which is number two. So we'll do that and then I'll do rainbow chain. And I will do simclip. So simclip is just a little command that um, uh, cuts a, it adjusts the clipping planes uh, symmetrically around the center of rotation. So you just have a slab of density. So let's do like simclip 15 or something. Just makes everything more visible. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna move that model to the center of the map. So I'm, there's two ways we can do this. The first way, is just to deactivate um, the map. So change that to that, and then move this guy over approximately to the position. That's, that's one way, that's probably the easiest way. If your model is a long way away and it's inconvenient to do that, there is another way you can do it. So if it was say over here and I wanted to move it to there, um, I could use uh, this command. So move CRFR model, whatever. Um, in this case, that would be, it is model zero. And that will move the current model to the center of rotation. So that's convenient when you have lots of models and you want to move one to exactly the place uh, that, that you want. Okay, so now it's in the right location, but it's still really uh, wrong in terms of orientation. So what we're going to do now is use this command over here, um, which is basically kind of like a real space molecular replacement operation. It's going to um, try a, a bunch of random orientations and random displacements to fit the model to the map. Um, let me see. Okay, so in this case, we want to fit that to um, uh, volume two. We're going to search 100 different uh, candidate orientations in a radius of five angstroms around the current center of the molecule. So let's see how that goes. So it's gonna do those and then it will come up with a table of fits. And you can see the first, obviously the first one seems to be right, but let me bring these up so that you can see them. Right, and so what you wanna be looking for here in this table is a clear separation between the correct solution and the incorrect solutions. And so you can see you've got that here. You've got a, um, I'm not sure whether this is actually a correlation value, I don't think so, but in any case, it's a measure of, of fit of one description or another. And you can see it's much higher for the first item in the list than for the second. The second, interestingly enough, locally is okay, but basically what it's doing is it's, it's, um, it's fitting it crosswise. You've got uh, alpha, beta, um, uh, you've got a pseudo symmetry in the molecule and so it's, it's, it's fitting the incorrect, but sort of almost right uh, uh, orientation there, whereas everything else, Below that is, you know, more or less junk. But this one is right, so that's good. Um, we can now clear that list, and now we have our correct orientation. Um, if that doesn't work, uh, so if you don't get anything good out of that, but you can see that, you know, you should be able to fit your model to the map, the first thing I would suggest is to blur the map. Um, you will usually have a much uh, a larger radius of convergence if you use a map that's been um, low pass filtered. In Chimera, you can easily do that either in the volume viewer. Uh, so if you go to tools, volume filter, or you can do it using a command. So if I wanted to do that in this case, I would do something like bot Gaussian um, uh, to SDEV 2.5, something like that. 
and that will um, give me a much blurrier map. And that will be a lot easier to fit things to, um, uh, uh, but we don't need that right now, so I'm going to remove it. Okay. So uh, next thing I want to do is I'm going to convert this to a wireframe rest representation because I find that much the model to a wireframe representation because I find that much easier for analyzing fit to map. Um, so I have a little script for that. Um, so we'll do coot mode wire um, and we'll do two. And so now we have a coot like view of the world, um, which I find useful. Actually, for this kind of low resolution, what I'll usually do is I'll remove the backbone and just have C alphas and side chains. So I'll do CA uh, and side chains. Um, and then I'm going to make that all wire. And this I find just nice for looking at things. I'm going to do rainbow chain again. And Okay, um, so let's just have a little bit of a look around the map and see what we can see. We want to have a look and see like if there's any unmodeled density. So, and of course there is. As I mentioned, I removed one of the helices from uh, each of the alpha chains and you can see that here. Um, let's just adjust the, let's just adjust that up a little bit. And so you can see that the C terminal helix from both of the alpha chains is missing, but it looks quite nice and modelable. And we're going to do that in Coot in a little bit. And what you'll also see if we go to one of the um, to the B or the D chains, you can see these guys while they look overall pretty similar in terms of the secondary structure and so on, there are quite a lot of things that that don't look quite right in terms of uh, uh, the fit. So you can see here, this whole bit is, is misfit and doesn't look quite right. Um, you can also see that I've admitted the heme there. So those are the things, and you can see like this side chain, while it might well be a tryptophan in the beta chain, it certainly doesn't match the map, right? Um, so those are the things that we're going to want to fix in Coot. All right, um, next. So uh, if you guys are going through that, um, you can save the PDB at that point and then open it up in Coot. Uh, there is also one that I prepared earlier there that, that you can open up uh, if you want to do that. Um, so I'm going to move to Coot now. And we're going to open that guy up. So uh, if, if you're doing this off the pre-generated data, what you want to do is you want to open up initial model moved.pdb. And then we will open the map, which is in extra maps. And you want a ridge manual sharp 150 Z flip. There's a bunch of other maps there, which we'll get to later. Most of those are comparing different ways of sharpening the map um, to try to give you an idea of, the, of how dramatic the effect of correct post-processing post is on your map interpretability. OK, so here we go. Uh, I'm going to set this to a more appropriate uh, threshold. Uh, if you've installed my trimmings, um, you can do this a couple of ways. Uh, so one way is if you type if, is if you use the shortcut Shift L, it'll come up with a little box, and you can just type the new threshold you want and then hit Enter. Um, or you can do Shift two, three, four, five, six, etc. I I use a trackpad, so I don't like having the uh, scroll wheel thing on because it drives me nuts. But yeah, however you want to do it is fine. Um, a few things in terms of shortcuts. So uh, the square bracket, the two square bracket keys, you can use to cycle between different representations of the model which is useful because it means you don't have to go to the display manager every time you want to change one of those things. Um, likewise, uh, the forward slash key will toggle the map on and off. And the tilde key, um, the little squiggly one, um, will uh, toggle the map on and off, which I find that useful because often I just want to see the model without the map or the map without the model while I'm, while I'm building. Um, yes. Uh, was there anything else I wanted to do there? 
Oh yeah, if you're using a Mac and you haven't used Coot much before, I'd highly recommend um, going to the preferences in Xquartz and uh, changing this setting to emulate three button mouse. So that means that then when you use option, uh, option left click, uh, that will emulate the middle button of a mouse on a Linux system and allow you to correctly center on an atom. So to go like, for example, to center on this guy and then, and then we're good. Um, yes. Da, 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 da. So this is all basic crude stuff. I'm going to assume you're more or less familiar with it. Um, but in terms of view, if this is something you haven't done before, you can, um, uh, control right click and drag left to right in order to make a thin slab or up and down in order to translate that slab in Z, which is useful to get the exact view that you want when you're building. Always with uh, CryoEM maps, um, with any map really, but particularly with CryoEM maps because they're horribly inconsistent in terms of the way they're processed, you'll want to go to the refinement and regularization parameters. So that's right up here in the top right hand corner and set the refinement weight. You can do an auto estimation. Um, I wouldn't like, uh, I'd take that with a grain of salt. I'd use that as a starting point. And if you find that you need to raise it or lower it, um, uh, you certainly can. So basically the, um, the lower this weight is, the, uh, the more the weight on uh, uh, your prior knowledge, so the more the weight on protein geometry, and the higher it is, the more the weight on the map. So if you reduce it to zero, you're basically just doing a simulation. There's no contribution of the map. If you make it really high, your atoms are gonna become unbonded and explode everywhere. And you wanna find somewhere in the middle where your map and your model are happily playing well together. Okay, so the first real thing we're gonna do is we are going to go to the C terminus of the current C terminus of one of the alpha chains and we're gonna build in a helix there. Um, so useful shortcut, if you don't know it, uh, for go to atom is control G. So if we hit control G, a little box, which you can't see because it's on my other screen, is going to appear. Uh, and then we'll type um, A118. So that means chain A residue 118. And then just hit enter. And that will take us to residue 118 of chain A. Um, right. I'm just going to adjust this a little bit. So now you can see we're at the end of the current model. Uh, and we're at the position where we can see there is a nice unmodeled helix. So what we're going to do is we're going to navigate to roughly the center of that helix, rotate around to make sure you are more or less in the center of that tube of density. And then we are going to uh, place that helix. I have that bound to a shortcut. If you have my trimmings, you'll also have that bound to the same shortcut of um, H, lowercase h. Otherwise, you can find it in calculate uh, other modeling tools and uh, place helix here. But I tend to use the shortcut because having all the menus drives me nuts. Um, so we press H and now we have a helix. And so what you can see here, so this is good actually, um, Coot wasn't completely confident about which way this helix should go. So it's placed two going in either direction. Um, how do we tell the difference between those or how do we tell which one's right? Obviously in this case, we know, right? It's at the C terminus. So we know that the end terminus of the helix is gonna be down there where the C terminus uh, of the preceding part is. However, if we didn't know that, and if we just wanted to look at the map, um, one thing uh, that I would remember as a useful guide is that helices are more or less like Christmas trees in that you expect that overall the side chains uh, will point back down uh, uh, towards the end terminus of the helix. And so that's a useful, useful guide when you're building uh, de novo. And you can see that that checks out in this case. Um, it's a little subtle in this particular case, but hopefully you can see in this view that this one's pointing that way, that one's pointing that way, that one's pointing that way, that one's pointing that way. They're all pointing back down towards the end terminus. That's what you wanna be looking for when you're building. Because at this kind of resolution, it is easy to get, the wrong way around and to, to build things backwards. It happens, um, uh, particularly when you're a little lower than this at like four and a half, you know, 4.2, it's easy to, to build backwards. Um, yeah, go ahead, Liz. Cool, this is, uh, that's cool. 
Um, I was wondering, Ali, like what, how do you usually build um, de novo? Do you, do you think it's better to build polyalanine first and then try to register later? How do you approach? The yeah, so that's a good question. So um, if you have any prior knowledge at all in terms of a domain that's been solved or, uh, uh, or a domain for which you have a homology model, that is where you would always want to start, right? Um, uh, something that can more or less anchor you in sequence will help you tremendously. If you don't have that, then I would, yeah, I would start by placing um, some polyalanine helices. You can either do that manually or you can use something like Phoenix, uh, find helices and strands um, uh, to do that, or, or the Phoenix auto model building uh, tool, Phoenix mapped model. Um, I still haven't had much luck with that for actual sequence assignment at this kind of resolution. I'm sure it's much better at higher resolution, but I tried it on this map and it got it totally wrong, which is fine. You can then take it and modify it. I just find it a lot less work to do it from scratch than to fix all the wrong things. Oh, okay. Um, Wait, so have you actually used map to model in Phoenix and has on the I have, yes. I, oh. I used it on I used it on this map while I was preparing for the tutorial. Oh, okay. Okay, cool. Um, unfortunately, I didn't do that in time to include that model in the, um, in the tarball, but I can send it to anyone who wants. Um, but basically, it got, it got you know, uh, a lot of helices right at the secondary structure level, but a lot of the sequence assignment wrong, um, which then just becomes a bit of a pain to, to fix up. What I prefer to do is to go through, place polyalanine helices, starting in the best parts of the map, and try to identify um, sequence anchors. So try to identify uh, regions that are, let me see if I can go down to a little bit later on where we have that sequence in here somewhere. You'll wanna identify regions with sort of unique um, uh, uh, strings of bulky residues in a, in a yeah. unique pattern. So like in this case, you might look along here and you might say, okay, like um, this guy, this, this, this region here looks like it might be a promising one to locate because you have um, F, X, X, F, um, you have methionine and arginine on, on the other side of that. Um, and that's followed by a proline, which is probably a little kink. And then a little later, you have a, another double aromatic. So if the density in that region is good, that should be pretty easy to locate. So I would find as many of those kind of fragments as you can, and then basically extend them in both directions in parallel. All right, cool. Thanks. Yeah, it makes a lot yeah. of sense. Um, but as I say, if you have prior knowledge, use it in, in any respect. Um, it'll always be helpful. Um, right. And anyway, so as, so as I was saying, in this case, we know. And, and, and you can tell from the density also. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna delete the uh, one that is the wrong way around. So I'm gonna go custom, delete, and then delete this guy, and we'll keep this one. Let me just go back up to where we were. Whoops. Uh, bum, 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 bum. All right, so, um, we want to uh, uh, make this helix so it's going to match up perfectly in the sense that we want the first helix, first residue of this helix to be the next one after the end of the preceding chain. So I'm going to remove that first one, which was the equivalent of that guy. And you can see these guys should merge together pretty well now. I'm also going to just check and uh, have a look. And you can see that actually Coot has done pretty well here in terms of getting the length of the helix right because it just goes to unstructured after that. If that wasn't the case, you can obviously trim the helix uh, using delete zone, um, or uh, you can extend the helix. I have a little function for grow helix. So if you go to um, build grow helix and we click on this guy, and then we want to grow it by 10, that'll just add in 10 extra residues in ideal helix uh, um, with ideal helix backbone confirmations. And I'm just going to delete those now because we don't need them. Okay, uh, so let's just refine this guy into the density. So we're gonna use real space refine zone up here. And just click on the ends. Uh, you might see if you're familiar with previous versions of Coot, this looks a little different. Um, in particular, you'll notice the green balls. The green balls are real-time validation um, 
uh, AIDS. Uh, these guys uh, report on the um, Ramachandran. Uh, you can also add ones in to report on the uh, Rotoma um, uh, favorability. In my hands, the ones for Rotoma favorability slow down my system a lot, so I leave them off, but um, your mileage may vary. And this all looks pretty good. Um, one thing you might also notice with the new version is that the uh, flexible fitting has changed a bit and it's much better now for refining into uh, low resolution maps. It's much more responsive. Okay, so we're happy with that. We'll click enter and accept it. So now what we want to do uh, in order to merge this into the molecule, first we want to renumber this helix so that it matches up with um, the numbering of our molecule. So I've got a little aid for doing that. So I'm gonna center on, so like option click on one of the residues in the helix. It doesn't really matter which, but in this case, we'll reset, we'll just do it on the first one. And we wanna set the numbering of this helix such that this residue is 119. Um, so we'll go to custom, uh, renumber, and we'll do renumber active chain by first residue. And we're gonna set the first residue to 119. And now that's adjusted the offset such that uh, that helix is renumbered. Okay, all good. So now uh, we want to merge that into our first into our molecule and then into our chain. So we'll do custom uh, merge uh, merge two molecules. We'll click the original molecule that we want to merge it into, and then click the helix molecule that we want to be merged into that molecule. Okay. So now they're merged, but you can see they're still separate chains. So let's fix that. So custom, merge, uh, merge chains, and then click the original chain and click the new chain. And now they're happy and all good. Um, however, uh, two things. One, we want to um, just refine that a wee bit, um, just to make sure that the juncture between those is all good. It'll do for now. Um, but the other thing is this guy's all polyalanine. So we're going to want to uh, uh, adjust the sequence of that helix, not just the sequence register, but put in all the right residue identifiers. So in the tutorial, uh, that is covered here. Um, so I think I have that file open. So I have a file with the sequences. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the um, mutate mutate active chain to template sequence. So this will just literally mutate all of the residues in the chain based on a, sequ a raw sequence that you paste in. So it's important, obviously, that the numbering of the sequence uh, uh, matches up with the numbering of your molecule. So if, you're, if, you're, if your model is numbered such that the N-terminal methionine is there, you want the methionine to be there in the sequence that you paste in. Um, so we'll just delete this text, and then we're going to replace that with the text from the sequence file. So we're going to grab this one, because uh, we're dealing with the alpha chain, copy that. And then if we can find that window, there we go. Then we're just going to paste that in. If you're on a Mac, uh, for pasting into one of these text boxes, you want to use the control key, not the command key. So it is control V, not command V, um, or Apple V, whatever. And just paste that in, and then we'll mutate that. I've got it set up so that it mutates all the residue identifiers, but it does not add in the side chains. Uh, I prefer to add those in manually. Um, there are a couple of ways you can do that. Uh, my preferred way is using a, uh, a shortcut um, uh, shift M. So if I type shift M, a little box will come up and then you can just type in the residue identifier that you want there. So in this case, I'm just mutating a histidine to a histidine. I'll hit enter. It just mutates it. It doesn't adjust the rotomer. But then if you type shift R, that will cycle through the, uh, uh, the most likely rotomers and we can you know, leave it as whatever we want, um, refine it a bit, uh, however you like. The other way you can go um, is to uh, use the shortcut K, which will fill sidechain. So lowercase k will fill the sidechain, but that does an extra refinement step, which at low resolution can uh, cause you issues. Doesn't really matter because we can always just refine this guy back into a happy place. And now that's looking better. And so I would go through that and, and 
do that um, for all of them. You can easily script it so that uh, uh, it'll do that for a whole range. Um, I just uh, I just prefer to start off with stubs so that I know what I've actually touched, um, if that makes sense. Okay, uh, so we can, um, let me see, we can go to the end of this guy. If we want to add in extra residues here, um, we can do that using either add terminal residue, which you can uh, see over uh, here. So this one, um, or there's a shortcut for that as well, which is Y. So the letter Y will add in a terminal residue. Um, we can keep doing that. You can see that in this case, that's going to be going the wrong direction in a tick. So let's just refine that. And then we can drag it into the direction we want. And then add another one maybe. And the nice thing about that mutate function is now if we go to uh, that same function again, it remembers the sequence you, you pasted in before. So if we just want to update those polyalanines that we've added just now, we can do that. And now they've all got the correct uh, identifiers. So we can see this guy's a tyrosine, that guy's a lysine, next one's an arginine, et cetera. Okay. Um, oh yeah, just a note. So, so in a real de novo building project, um, you, as I mentioned, you want to use all the prior knowledge you can. If you don't have a homology model uh, or any actual, you know, quote unquote, real structural data, probably the most useful source of information is going to be uh, uh, in order of importance, um, secondary structure prediction, followed by disorder prediction, and I guess other bioinformatic measures. But, but those are the two that I find particularly helpful. Um, and what I will usually do is I'll use this server, the Extelpred server, um, which just summarizes that information in a nice digestible way. Uh, you can see an example of that output here. Obviously for hemoglobin, it's very, very simple. Um, uh, uh, but this is just a useful um, tool. The reason being that secondary structure prediction is very, very accurate as a whole. So on a per residue basis, it's something like 70 to 80% accurate. So you know if you're building a helix into something that's predicted as beta sheet, you're almost certainly wrong. There are exceptions, but you know you want to be looking at it very carefully if you're building and you disagree with uh, secondary structure prediction. So you can see for here, for example, if we have a look at the borders of this helix, where are they compared to the prediction? So you can see this helix goes roughly from about 119 to uh, 137. And you can see here, uh, you know, it's confidently going from about 119 to 139. So it's pretty good. So use that information. Also the, the disorder prediction, which you can see here underlined is also useful. It's useful as a guide. So if you hit a region where you run out of density to build, it's greatly encouraging if you then look at the uh, disorder prediction and find, ah, oh, this region is predicted as intrinsically disordered. That makes sense. I, I think, you know, it gives you some extra confidence in what you're doing. Okay, uh, so that's that part covered. Um, Next, um, what we want to do is we want to generate a threaded model for the beta subunit. So if you remember, I've replaced the beta subunit um, with an alpha subunit, and we're going to make a model of the beta subunit using the alpha as a template. That sounds very convoluted when I say it, but it, but it should be fairly, fairly simple. So we're going to go to an atom in chain B, uh, which is one of the beta chains. So let's say control G, uh, B63. Uh, and I'm going to copy uh, uh, this guy. So custom, copy, copy current chain. So I'll go custom, copy, copy current chain. And so now if I turn the map off, we have one chain that's being copied. So uh, what you can do is you can uh, then save that individual chain as a PDB, which we can use as a model to make a homology model. I've already saved that, so I won't do that right now. But what I will do is I'll launch uh, CCP4 um somewhere so i still like the old school ccp4 interface because i guess i'm old um and we're going to open up a chainsaw job so chainsaw is just a useful you can use anything you like this is the one i use there are many different there's probably servers and whatever um i use chainsaw it's pretty easy um however you like 
Um, so you just want to put in uh, the PDB. So that'll be an extra models, uh, change the alpha if you haven't saved it yourself. And then you want to put in, you need to change this to faster. The default is PIR. You want to change it to faster and then put in uh, uh, the appropriate sequence. Uh, by default, it will have, it won't show up. You've got to change that file name filter to faster rather than FAS, but anyway, um, once it does, you can put it in there and then you can run that. Um, uh, okay, that's fine. Um, I've already run this, I've already generated the thing. You can uh, run it. Um, don't be surprised with any CCP4 uh, utility if you have to run it two or three times before you realized you got a parameter wrong and you need, Often I will I will run uh, jobs like three times until I figure out that I forgot to change uh, the format of the sequence file or something. Uh, but it will work, and it's a very fast and simple utility for making homology models. Okay, so let's get out of CCP4. So now um, I'm going to just quickly delete that guy because we don't need it anymore, and I'm going to load up our homology model. So if I go back to extra models, chain B, chainsaw beta. So that's this guy. And what you will be able to tell in a tick is that, um, so chainsaw is not changing the positions of any of the atoms. All it's doing is making a threaded model. That is, it's adjusting the sequence, it's deleting regions that aren't conserved, and it's pruning non-conserved residues back to the um, back to the C beta atom. Which is why you can see, um, for example, this guy, which was a phenylalanine in the original incorrect model, the phenylalanine side chain has been removed because it's actually a valent. And if we have a look at the at the at the density, you can see that that's probably right. It needs to be moved over a little bit, but it looks a lot more like a valent than it does like a phenylalanine. So we can go through and, and fix all those things. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're going to delete the original chain B like we did before. So I'm gonna center on that guy, do custom, uh, delete, delete active chain. And now we're gonna merge this guy into the other one. So we'll do custom, merge, merge two molecules, click on that one, click on that one. Now it's part of our, our molecule. Um, we in this case we actually also want to do that for the other chain i don't think i did that in the tutorial but we might as well so what we're going to do is find chain d wherever it is over here okay so what we're going to do is we're going to um where is the other guy oops let me delete that guy so we've still got our chainsaw model so what we want to do is align that chainsaw model on chain D. So the way we do that, let me actually keep that displayed, is we're going to go to calculate SSM superpose. So this is a secondary structure ma matching um, uh, uh, superposition algorithm. The reference structure is the one we want to move the thing to. So, in that, so this is correct, but we want to use a chain, in this case D, and we want to move a, um, uh, uh, the chainsaw model there. Um, if we had lots of things we were doing this for, you would do move copy and then repeat this operation. Okay, so now we've got that in the place that we want it. Um, we can now, um, we can now, uh, delete the other guy, wherever it is. Yeah, so let's delete this guy and redisplay this guy. Um, bum, 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 bum. Okay, so now we just do the same thing again merge, merge two molecules, click this guy, click this guy. Okay, so now we have a model that is still not correct, uh, but it has at least the correct sequence for the two subunits that we know are wrong, that is B and D. Um, mm -mm -mm. Oh yeah, so one nice thing in the new version of Coot, if we go to either of these two chains, is we can flexibly fit an entire chain in a reasonably fast manner. So using that refine menu uh, that I mentioned, if I go somewhere in the chain I want to refine, 
um, let's say something like that. And we do refine and then do, we can do chain refine, all atom refine will refine the entire molecule, but let's just do chain refine for now. And that will allow for flexible fitting um, of uh, our guy. Um, and if I just change that to all atom, then that should, yeah, right. And you might wanna pop the map on, have a look around. Um, you don't need to necessarily do too much at this stage, but it's just to get it into, you know, in this case, there weren't many dramatic alterations. If you had like a helix that was out of the density or a loop that needed to be re reconfigured, this is the stage at which you would do that. Um, and you could do that just by, you know, uh, just by adjusting these guys by pulling them around. You can see here that one residue has got lost because of a misalignment in the sequences that we used uh, uh, for the chainsaw model. If we think that's okay, we can hit enter. I'll just delete that guy because he's not useful. Okay. Um, uh, something like this is a pretty easy fix. So we might do, if you don't have sphere refine in your interface, uh, it's useful. So it's for refining instead of a linear sequence of residues, refining a sphere of residues around a given residue or a given point. Uh, you can add that if you just right click on the toolbar and click manage buttons. There's a bunch of things you can add. Um, uh, uh, sphere refine, I find, or sphere refine plus, I, I find particularly useful. And so we can do that. And then you can try to rearrange this so that it's a more sensible rotomer. You could also do this just by, um, uh, by playing with the, the rotomers, but um, we'll do this for now. This is not perfect uh, because the backbone also needs to be fixed. But this is what we're going to do for the moment. I'm not sure which way around this guy is actually. Leave him like that for now. Um, yeah, and so the next step after this, I would go, um, like I mentioned, you can go residue by residue and you want to inspect both the backbone uh, fit um, the sequence registration uh, in case there were any errors in the homology model um, uh, and the configuration of the, of the rotomers with respect to the map. Um, so for example, uh, let me see if I go to 72B, you can see here that this guy needs a side chain. So let's add a side chain in. In this case, it's actually almost in the right um, uh, uh, one already. Um, and where's 104? 104 must be around here somewhere because I mentioned it. Mm. Oh yeah, okay. So that guy needs a bit of adjustment. So you can see that guy's clashing. I should be able to fix that pretty easily. And you can see we have a bit of a unhappy Ramachandran. Yeah. Oops. Play around with that. And we'll fix up this guy. So now that guy is looking pretty good. And you can see by the way that this guy is actually stacking with that heme that we haven't placed yet. We'll get to that in a little bit. So, okay, another example, um, you'll find that you have loops that you need to fit where they're not built in and they need to be. So an example of that you can find at residue 46 in the beta subunit. So if you go to 46B, you can see if I switch to C alpha view, you can see that we have a nice looking loop here that has not been built in. 
Um, we have a little fragment of peptide that's been, in, you know, left in the homology model. We'll just get rid of that because it's not very useful. Okay, so we've got, um, you know, 10 residues gap basically. Um, and now, uh, so first I would start by just refining the termini. So we'll just do a little real space refined zone on uh, this guy. That guy was okay already. And the same over here. This one looks a bit more off. Okay. Um, you can see, so this is one thing to pay attention to when you're building. Often uh, the uh, C beta and the amide nitrogen will end up the wrong way around. They're usually fairly easy to, whoops, usually fairly easy to reconfigure like that. Um, that's still not quite right. More like that, or like that. Oops, a daisy. Oops. Come on, bud. Yeah. That'll do for now. And now we want to add the uh, missing residues in. So we'll just do that using add terminal residue. Which, uh, don't be too fastidious about this. You just want to get something in there that you can then refine. At some point, it's going to go a bit off into the woods. So you might want to just refine that out of the little hole that it got into. And then let's just keep going. We just want to get something semi decent in there that we can then um, refine. And so once you get to this point, you'll notice these guys are clashing because we've accumulated a bunch of errors while we were building that loop. That's fine. I'm just going to add that extra guy in there. It'll look totally bananas. Um, but uh, usually when you refine that, you can fix that. It won't be perfect. And it'll require some playing around, but you can use it as a starting point. Hey, Ali. Yeah. I have a question related to building into loops. Um, if, if there's not very well resolved density for the loop, would you still recommend um, following what you just showed us or, and then before moving into refinement or, yeah, how, how yeah, would you um, recommend? So, sure. So if there is no density, don't build. Um, so, so basically you only want to be building in if you have interpretable density. So like in this case, this density is weak, um, but it's pretty clearly interpretable. Um, and you can see that this looks overall pretty, pretty good. If it's just really scattered, um, disordered density, then you have to make a judgment call about where you think you can confidently model it. Now, I mean, you may want to create a model which has that loop in like, using Rosetta or using something else that is more relying on what we know about protein geometry and how proteins fold. Um, but for building the model that you're going to be depositing with the map, I would recommend only interpreting places where, where there's sufficient density to interpret. Does that make sense? Yeah, awesome. Thanks. For um, Ollie, do you um, recommend Maybe you can build the density in, but truncate it to alanines or something like some people do that. What do you think of that? Uh, I would say if there's no density, don't build. Um, the where I would, so you raise a good point though about ambiguity. So in, it depends what you're not confident about. If, the, if you can build in the loop fine, but you're not confident about sequence registration, then my recommendation would be to uh, truncate um, back to C beta and to label those residues as UNK. So not as alanine, but to change to UNK because UNK 
has the geometry of an alanine, but it explicitly delineates that you know that you don't know the identity of that residue. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's the way I would go. There's no real standard, but that's what I would standard, prefer yeah. to do. All right, thanks. Um, in this case, I'm fairly happy with that loop. Uh, you can see you've got a nice little single turn of helix there, more or less. Um, everything looks pretty good, so we'll accept that. And then uh, what we want to do is we want to match the sequence of the beta. So if I grab that, um, oops. I think I left this uh, methionine off the sequence in the table. You might want to add that back because otherwise it'll be out by one. But anyway, I'm going to grab that, pop it in there, mutate. And now we can go through and see, have we got this right? Does it make sense, et cetera? Um, so if we have a look here, you can see, OK, this guy's a leucine. So that makes sense. So let's pop a leucine in. That looks pretty good for a leucine. Uh, three names, sure, whatever. It's kind of hard to tell right here. Serine, little, makes sense. We've got a proline at a kink, which is kind of nice. Aspartate, no density as per usual. Valine, yeah, that looks like a nice valine. Pop that in. Methionine, don't have much density for that, really. Asparagine, da, 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 da. Oh, another proline. Okay, well, let's pop that in. Lysine. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's, yeah, that's more or less what I would do there. Um, next, next thing uh, I want to show you guys is to how to place a ligand. So in this case, we're going to place a heme because we have a heme. So we're going to navigate to the center of the density of the heme, which is this big blob here. And we're going to get a heme. We're going to do that using the get monomer tool. So file, get monomer, and type in the three-letter code. In this case, it's H-E-M. If you don't know the three-letter code, you can look it up if you do file uh, search monomer library. Or you can find it on the internet in the CCP4 monomer library. But in this case, we do know it, and it's HEM. And let's put that in. So we now have a heme. All of the monomer definitions of hemes of various sorts seem to be a bit screwed up from what I can tell. Like you can see the geometry of this metal center is a bit, a bit strange. Um, and you can also see that the little cartoon that Coot generates of a heme is um, a little bit weird. I'm not quite sure why that is. It's been reported at one point or another, but it's still um, there. I'm just going to delete the hydrogens because I find but, them annoying. I think there is XF's data that says that that metal is actually out of plane. So I'm not sure that's as weird as you think it is. I just had my undergraduate biophysics class analyze these hemoglobin. It's not so much that it's out of plane. It's that um, it is not centered between the uh, nitrogens. Uh, the, the, if you if you notice, it's not it's it's not um, uh, the bonds are not of equal length. It's asymmetric. No, you're you're correct, Oliver. I, I I work in heme chemistry and catalysis. All of everyone uses their custom like custom made SIFs. Yeah, they're all they're all a bit screwed up from what I can tell. Yeah, they've um, just never fixed it. I know. I reported it some time ago. Um, but uh, anyway, Sorry, so the, so the SIF includes, is this true? The SIF includes the force parameters that Coot needs to do the uh, uh, flexible refinement? Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, the, 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 the SIF file, but there's no, we're not, I presume there's a SIF for the one from the Monomer library. Um, but yes, it will have, um, it will have that information. Sure the, the, the stock PDB, if you pull it up by the stock 3D PDB three-letter code. The coordinates the, are wrong. The SIF will include force constants that are good enough for code to refine. Yes, correct. Well, and you'll see, you'll, see that in a, you'll see that in a tick. Um, so first of all, I'll remove the hydrogens uh, because I don't like them and they're annoying. Uh, so we'll get rid of those. And then we want to orient this in the density. We can do that manually. 
Uh, but Kud has a useful function called jiggle fit, which just kind of like what I showed you in Chimera, just tries uh, random orientations and displacements and then refines them and see which has the best uh, correlation. I've got that bound to capital J. So if I press shift J, it will make its best guess at the orientation. In this case, you can see that it's wrong. So it's right in the in in one way in the overall uh, uh, in the overall shape, but you can see that um, because the heme is you know pseudo symmetric, uh, the two carboxylate groups have been misplaced, um, pointing into uh, hemoglobin. So let's try that again, um, and if it does not work, then we'll do it manually. So in this case, it got it wrong. So what we're going to do is we're going to, um, you can you can probably do this just by, well, so there's two ways you can do it. You can either use, you know, rotate translate um, zone. So click on that, click on this guy, and then we can just uh, rotate that around Z and pop it where we want it to be. Um, that is probably correct. And then we can uh, rigid body fit that. And that's probably pretty good. And then we can uh, refine that in. And you can see now it does become square. This guy is still not quite right. But I think this is more or less correct, even for. Um, so you can see that the two hydrophobic su substituents are a little different. So there are a couple of ways you could get this wrong. So you want to pay attention to, to which way those guys go. Uh, and now we can move, we can merge that into the molecule. So we're going to do custom merge, uh, merge two molecules, merge that in, and now we'll sphere refine again to fix up that clash with the histidine. Um, if you want to actually, you'll need to uh, make a link in order to get it to really coordinate the metal like it should, but we'll leave it as it is for now. So now that's a good. Um, Starting point, yeah. The, the the heme geometry in a lot of things is a bit is a bit messed up. But anyway, um, fortunately, I don't usually deal with heme, so it's fine for me. Um, right. So uh, after you've done all this, um, and I would recommend doing this, you know, obviously in much more detail, much more extensively than I've done here, you can load up the reference model, uh, which should be more or less correct and then compare it um, to your guy um, and go through and you know see how things how things compare in terms of you know so you can see that the overall orientation of the heme is fine um, some of the side chains will be different there's going to be a you're going to make a lot of small mistakes at this resolution you're never going to get it perfect but i think it's kind of good exercise to go through and make the best model you can without consulting the reference model and see how well you do. It's a relatively small model. It's relatively relatively small molecule, so it shouldn't take you all that long. But it's good uh, practice, uh, good practice ground. Um, and um, next thing we want to do. So th this is more or less just something for you guys to do uh, when you have the time. Um, but basically, I've post-processed this map in a number of different ways. Uh, uh, and you might want to have a look at them to see how they can differ. So basically, this is to emphasize the point that you don't want to ever just trust the auto processing of whatever software you're using. In this case, I made the um, initial map in CryoSpark. And if you have a look here, this is the initial uh, auto sharpened map out of CryoSpark. And you can see it looks terrible. It looks very low resolution. But if you take that same uh, uh, map and then sharpen it in either um, uh, phoenix.resolve cryoem or system or uh, phoenix auto sharpen, it looks a lot better. I personally actually like the one from phoenix um, uh, resolve the best, uh, but you can play around with it and see how you go. I've included the um, raw uh, uh, unfiltered half maps in that table, so you can play with it how you like and see how you get the, the best map. Um, you can so, also, 
Uh, Ali, yeah, what's the ahead, basic no. difference between the cryo spar? Obviously, the algorithm is different. I assume it's not just incompetent coding. What's the basic difference in the algorithms between the different programs? Uh, well, CryoSpark, I couldn't tell you because we don't really have that information. Um, uh, Phoenix is doing a lot. So, the, so um, Phoenix Resolve is uh, basically an outgrowth of you know Resolve density modification for crystallographic maps. Um, adapted for cryo-EM maps. So it does things in a fundamentally different way. It's not just a B-factor sharpening, um, uh, which, most of the, which most of the others are. Um, but I would just in general try, and I know system does something a little bit different as well. I would in general just try several different packages and see what you uh, prefer. It's really about interpretability. The map that I've been using, the map that I've been using so far was actually just manually sharpened in a way which I'll just show you. So if you go to the, um, if you load up the CryoEM module, uh, which is under, uh, let me see, calculate modules uh, CryoEM, then you have a, uh, a sharp and blur tool, which we can use to make, uh, you know, uh, uh, maps that are sharpened or blurred by a given B factor. So in this case, you know, let's say we want to do it, we want to make a really blurred map, we can put in 100. You can also use this for resampling, which if you have a, um, if you have a map where you're close to Nyquist, let's say your resolution is 2.5 and your pixel size is one angstrom, uh, you probably want to resample that on a finer grid. Uh, and this is a convenient way of doing that. You can resample by a factor of one and a half or whatever it happens to be, and that'll make your map look a lot nicer. So something to be aware of. So um, your, your go-to is Phoenix. Does that need a model or you can sharpen in Phoenix without a model? It does not need a model. You can use, and so there are two different things in Phoenix. There's Phoenix Resolve CryoEM, which is the newer one, which is only available in, I think, the nightly builds, or it might be in the stable version now. Uh, and there's Phoenix.AutoSharpen. Both of those are very different in terms of what they're, what they're doing. But I would try both. Okay, um, but manually sharpening in Coot is very useful because it's very fast and you can do it on the fly. Um, and the map that I've been using was manually sharpened in Coot, just manually sharpened to taste. So just uh, you know adjust by different B factors and see what you like for interpretability. In this case, if we apply you know um, a B factor of 100, um, you can see that we now have a map that has more sausage-like helices. Oh, uh, and if you, one shortcut that I have in there that I didn't mention, um, if you uh, use shift uh, tilde, I guess, so, or whatever it is, the, the same one that you use for toggling the map, but if you use uh, shift with that, that will cycle between multiple maps. So that's useful if you want to compare multiple uh, 3D classes or multiple different ways of B factor sharpening, for example. Anyway, yeah, that's, that's more or less what I would say with regards to post-processing. The only other thing I want to mention is um, one of the advantages of Coot is that it's extremely extensible. Uh, so it's very easy to add little uh, functions yourself to uh, in order to do whatever you happen to want. Uh, so uh, it has an API which is reasonably well documented. Um, uh, uh, which you can find online. I think I included a link to the manual somewhere. Yes, there. And that has all of the different uh, functions that are built into Coot, which you can plug into a Python script uh, and, and use. They're all documented in Scheme, so they're documented in a little language, in a, in a different language, sorry. Uh, but the syntax is very similar. You just replace the uh, hyphens with underscores and you know, put in the brackets like you would have in Python and away you go. So, you know, for example, that little function that I showed you to quickly set the Mac level, um, this is what the uh, code looks like for that. Um, uh, and most of the code that's in here is just calling little functions that you can find in the manual. So it's extremely simple. And then you can add that as a key binding or you can add a menu item for it. Um, and if you just have a look at the Python script that I provided in the table, um, you should have a starting point that you can use to copy and paste and, you know, uh, change any way you want. Um, please do and make it nicer. It's all very hacked together. So if there's anything you want to fix, modify, go for it. I think my AirPods just died. Um, I'm not sure whether you can still hear me. 
Can everybody hear me still? Yeah, we yes, can still I can hear you. Hear you. Okay, yes. good. good, good. Um, yeah, uh, okay, so I think we've just about reached the end of the tutorial. I'm sorry it took a little bit longer, um, but I'm happy to hang around if you've got any questions or anything you want to discuss regarding model building or, or anything in particular, um, feel free to fire away. Ollie. Yes. Hey, can I ask if you if there's no if you want to make your own like in to fit into a map? Uh, like, yes, you can do that. Um, so there's several different ways of doing that. It's all a little bit awkward. Um, there is a Ligand builder in Coot. You can so the the way that I've done it in the past is using various tools to compare to convert a smile string. Uh, to a uh, to a molecule, you can do that in Coot. You can also do it. There's a little Phoenix utility um, uh, uh, to do that. Um, uh, or what you can do is you can take a related uh, uh, monomer and place it in the density, and then edit that monitor, which you can do in the uh, ligand. I think it's the Flev one. There's a ligand editor in Coot you can use to to do that. Um, let me see if I can actually find. So, uh, Ali, I miss, may I misunderstand this, but my understanding was that when you're playing with the ligand and coot and pulling on it, um, that it is actually using a, at least a crude molecular mechanics, whatever, force constants, molecular yes. mechanics force yes, field yes. to put it in. Um, the, uh, I, 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 I did not know that until you said it, but I guess the, the SIF files in PDB automatically Include yes. that, and then the, the, there's the, the, the tools you're showing. For, for, now. for anything, for most of the ones in the monomer library, yes. If you're bringing in an external ligand, you'll need to provide a SIF, which you can generate using about, uh, Phoenix yeah. Elbow or something. Yeah, so I was going to say, the tools you're talking about now with the smiles, they would generate the, the force constants? or no? They would not. They yeah, would where not. where you do you do that? Uh, so Phoenix, usually. Uh, so there's a tool called Elbow, which is something like electronic ligand optimization workbench or something like that. Um, so you can use Phoenix Elbow to generate a SIF file which will have those restraints. And you can then load that in uh, using uh, import SIF dictionary, and then that will, that will work. You use what, so you use, you, in Coot, you load it in through an import function, is that? Which I'm, which I'm showing you right now, import okay. SIF dictionary, this one. Uh, someone raised their hand, I'm not sure if the question is still, was it answered or? I had a question. Can you? Yeah, go ahead. Yep. Uh, what's the easiest way to flip a peptide? Oh, right. Um, that's a good question. I think it's bound. I have it bound to a key. I think. Yeah, Q. So if you send her on the if you send her on the residue and then press Q, it will flip the peptide. If you have the if you have the trimming script installed. And then one more question. Uh, yep. So what's the, what's the easiest way to flip an entire chain? To flip an entire chain, do you mean to change the direction? Yes. Right, yeah, so I have a, I have a script for that. Um, the way you can do that, it's a little bit janky, uh, but let's see how we go. Um, Okay, so I have that, where did I put that? Um, I have that here somewhere. It's a rebuild. Where is it? Oh, maybe it's in, um, I think I changed that in the version of the script that I don't have here, but you can do that in other modeling tools. So you can use the reverse direction. Uh, uh, thing in other modeling tools. That will then give you a C alpha model, which you can rebuild. Um, so let me see if I can do that right now. So if we click that guy, that should have reversed the direction. And you can see that what you have now is just a, a cloud of points for the C alphas. But what we can now do is we can go to custom, build and then rebuild backbone. 
and select that thing. And it should, yes, there we go. We now have a reversed um, peptide, which it'll then try to refine in. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. I had actually tried doing it this way one time and I had a lot of problems with it. Oh yeah, I, that's I, why I, so, so yes, it's, it's, so normally, particularly the rebuilding was very troublesome. Um, but I wrote that little rebuilding script in there, so it, it seems to work pretty robustly now. So, awesome, so that little, um, the custom build, rebuild backbone seems to work fairly well after you've made the reversed C alpha thing. In, in a version of the script that I wrote a little while ago and I haven't put up on GitHub yet, it does both at the same time, where it'll first make the C alpha model and then rebuild it automatically. Oh, I have a question, Ollie. Uh, sure. Um, I think Rosie had a question first. Okay, though. go ahead. Rosie, did you still hey, have a question? Sorry. Yeah, 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 I still do. Um, I think it's sort of like one I probably asked you before, but <clears throat> so once you've built in your model, um, how do you tell when it's okay? Like, for example, like, you know, you're going through different Ramachandra and Rotoma fits and clashes. And like, in some cases I find that, you know, if I want to have a Rotoma that's likely, it's impossible to avoid a clash. Or if I have, and like, it's like, where, how do I tell if a clash is too big? You know, like, how do I, how do you assess this? How do you weigh, like, what's more important? A likely Rotoma or a clash or, or a Ramachandra? Like, what's, how do you, how do you tell? <laughs> Unfortunately, there's no really good, good answer to that question. Um, uh, but yeah, you've just got to balance it because at, at low resolution, sometimes it's going to be really difficult to get your model perfect. Um, mm, of course. Yeah. Uh, and it's done when you are, when it's at a reasonable level of quality and you just can't improve it anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, um, yeah. So are there any ways to, like, I remember you saying something about how there are certain residues where rotomers, I think it's the longer ones, maybe like lysine. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I would pay more attention to uh, uh, poor rotomers for things like leucine, um, isoleucine, um, things where there are only like three or four pretty well-defined. Right. Um, okay. You know, which each have a, you know, a probability of like 20, 30% or whatever it happens to be. Um, mm -hmm. So those are the ones that I would look at first because things like arginines or lysines have a whole bunch of, of you know, of different rotomers that are, that are relatively similar to one another. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Thanks. Yongzi? You're on before me? No, but yeah, thanks Ollie for the great tutorial. So I have a question actually regarding like link connections and between ligers and proteins, for example, in a case oh, with your yeah. team, yeah, there are as well as things. like, you know, and glycans and stuff like that. So what's your workflow for that? Because sometimes when I put it in and I do some stuff and I come back, I realize some of the records get stripped away and like, oops, what did I do? Uh, yeah. yeah, it's, it's <laughs> still kind of a mess. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's not a great answer to that. It's a little kludgy at present, but yes, you want to put a link in um, and maintain it. It shouldn't disappear. But if you put it through certain certain software, I guess it might it might strip it. So, qu question relates to that: when you put okay. in the link in code, is it I possible? Just, just a question from Ryan first, I think. Sorry. Ryan, go ahead. Uh, sorry, uh, might be a bit of a long question, but do you know is there an easy way to take a polyalanine model and get a secondary structure or calculate a secondary structure of that? Um, and then be able to align that with a, a predicted secondary structure from the sequence. Right. So, I mean, the polyalanine model will have that secondary structure, right? Um, because you will have placed it as helices and strands, I would, I would presume. Um, in terms of aligning that, um, I'm not quite sure what you mean. If you haven't assigned the sequence, I mean, I guess if you have a, you know, so, so you mean in terms of you've got your directionality and you think you've got your connectivity and your lengths of your helices and you want to align that to a, um, 
uh, to a secondary structure prediction? Is that more or less it? Yes, I was just, I'm having trouble uh, getting the register and um, I was trying to think about a way to look at like a, a, I guess, take the polyalanine sequence with the secondary structure. Um, yeah, I, I know what you mean. So, yeah, no, so for me, I more or less do that manually where I, okay. will, I will have, I'll have a, a usually a, a PDF of the extrapred output, which I will annotate as I go along in terms of I'll annotate it as I find an anchor region that I'm very confident with. Um, and, you know, uh, towards the end, I'll annotate all the regions that I'm not confident of and go through them progressively uh, uh, to fix. Um, yeah, and I'll consult it to try to, you know, uh, as I'm building the connectivity of the model, that's what I will consult to say, okay, there's a short helix followed by a long helix. I think it matches this, et cetera. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, John? Just getting back to the link thing, is there a way to put in a distance with the link in Coot so that link will refine the distance to the link? Not that I know of, but I feel like there should be, and it may be just that I don't know uh, how to do it. But I couldn't find much, I couldn't find any um, real documentation on that. I was looking for that the other day myself. So a related question there, maybe there's another way to do this. So we have a you case- You can add in a harmonic restraint. So you, you, you can okay. add in a distance yeah. restraint. It, with the link record not, in not, not Not encoded in the link, but you can add one in in Coot for the purposes of real space. Separately, you can have a harmonic yes, restraint. Yes, and you just, yeah. you, you, where is that somewhere easy to find? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think you can add that in. I mean, I de I've definitely done it before using a scripting function. But I that, that's fine. If you don't have it handy, we can just, we can Google it up probably. At the, it's just, I didn't fine. know that. The, but if, but the, no, but yeah. I think if we pop in restraints, yeah, calculate model restraints. Here we are, add distance restraint. Oh, cool. Yeah, so, so you, want, you might want to have a play around with these different modules, which are extensions for Coot. Um, so, you know, ProSmart is another one, which is useful for secondary stru structure restraints and um, uh, 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 reference model restraints. Um, the CryoEM one I mentioned, the restraints one I mentioned. Carbohydrate is extremely useful for building N glycans, for automatically building N glycans. Um, so, so the protein that you've helped us with, it has an internal deletion that we engineered in, and we've had great trouble getting Coot to connect the two ends of it. I guess the link with the distance restraint, I guess in Phoenix, put, just putting in a link record works, um, but the, uh, well, I have to actually double check that. Um, to get the real space refinement and Coot to work on it, I guess the thing to do would be to put a link between well, that's the, it. So, between so the that amide and the, and the carbonyl carb uh, carbon, and then put a just standard distance restraint on that. Or the other thing you could do there is, um, uh, the name's escaping me, um, uh, what you do when you have a certain reference numbering that you want to maintain um, that doesn't, I can't remember the, the, the name for the flag and the PDB to do that. Um, but in that case, you shouldn't need to use a link. It'll just treat it as a covalently connected. Oh, so there's a PDB flag. Code. Sorry, I was looking for the word insertion code. If you use uh, insertion code, okay. that, might, that might be the uh -huh. Uh -huh. And then if no one else has a question, I have one more, but I'll let others get in front of me because this one's a different topic. I think, uh, unless, Rosie, did you, did you have another question or is that the same hand? Okay. Um, same no, hand. You, <laughs> Sorry. No, no worries. <laughs> go, go ahead, John. So um, again, for the project you've helped us with, we have like at this point 19 maps at 3.8 angstroms or better in the um, uh, these have very different confirmations and things bound to them. Um, and when we look in the uh, micellar region of this, there's what I would call lipidic crap that is you know actually quite consistent but not whole lipid molecules. Do, do you have a library? or reference point you use to build in stuff like that or, you know? I... So, um, right, so I, I tried adding some of the, so you can, so for just adding in common lipids quickly, is that the? Well, uh, not the, but this, the problem is it's not really the whole lipid, you, it's like, you know, fragmentary yeah, so that's, stuff. so that's tricky. Yeah. I mean, you can try just modeling in alkyl chains uh, uh, just, to, just to get a sense of it, um, which is something that I've certainly done in the past. Um, 
uh, or you can place in the, the lipid that you know is present, uh, you know, or that you believe is present, like PC or PG or whatever it happens to be. I was adding, I have a little library here. Yeah, can, you, can, can you then delete the things that there's zero density for while, yes, maintaining, absolutely. You while, maintaining, the, while maintaining the restraints so you can still get some reasonable fit? Yes, you can do that. You can delete the atoms that, that you can't see. That's, you can delete the atoms and in, 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 in that won't mess up the whatever the, the force parameters. Oh. Okay. Oh. That that. Thank you. And so I um, have put those. So I haven't. Uh, okay. So I haven't put those in. I have this common monomers thing, which just grabs some of the useful things. I've added a few lipids in there. I just don't have them in this version, but I'll pop that up on GitHub uh, when I get a moment. Thanks. No worries. Okay. So um, I guess nobody has any um, other questions. Uh, Thank you very much uh, for attending today. Um, feel free to uh, to email me um, or you know reach out via via whatever means um, if there's anything I can help with. And um, yeah, any feedback is appreciated. If um, if there's things that you would like uh, that I haven't covered or things that you'd like um, uh, to be altered, please please let me know. And otherwise, uh, you know, enjoy the rest of your Friday and have a uh, good weekend. Yeah, Ali, thanks tremendously for doing this. This was really great and also appreciate your organizational efforts. No worries. All right. Take care, everyone. Oh, and I'll put up a recording later on.